What's up, everybody? Ah, Chris B. Beautiful. Tex, can we get a mic check? I didn't hear you. Yep. Hey, what's going on, guys? Hey. Hey, everybody. Hey, hey. What's up, homies? What's up? What's up? We're about a minute out here. Let's get a couple more mic checks here. Jonas. Testing, testing. This is Eric. Perfect. Sound good, my man? Yeah. Everyone, uh, I feel like whenever these uh, lo-fi beats are going, you just you just want to talk all smooth jazz like. <laughs> That's how we talk all the time in here. That's the reason. There's a reason I always start our streams off with the nice lo-fi beats, man, because it really gets it going. I'm not gonna lie. It sets the mood. Well, well, guys, um, it looks like we have hit the the time marker. It is it is time to to launch. I wanted to uh, first say thank you to everyone that showed up here. Um, you know, we love doing these little events, um, and it's, it's really special to have Shapeshift with us today and these wonderful speakers. Uh, my name is Fatty Bags. I will be your host for today's smooth stream and Q and A. Um, with that being said, my favorite tagline, um, we would like to do a quick introduction. Um, Eric Voorhees is the founder of Shapeshift, a longtime advocate of the decentralization of crypto and uh, i would love for everyone to give him a nice big round of applause virtual round of applause everybody welcome eric um we have john who is the coo of shapeshift uh, another warm round of applause we'll keep it virtual i'll be the, the one guy doing it and then of course uh willie who is the product manager for shapeshift and uh, the person responsible for spearheading their decentralization into a dao um so welcome gentlemen we are very excited to have you and, and uh, very glad to have you up here. How are you guys doing today? Doing great. Glad to be here. Yeah. Best day ever. Yeah, doing, doing really great. Uh, happy to be here and super excited for uh, being here with the Olympus crew and for Fox Ponds launching tomorrow. I love it. I, I feel like my introduction was pretty quick. Is there anything that you guys want to add on to there that I might have missed that you'd like to tell the audience? I'll well, just add on that, you know, uh, for anyone who hasn't heard of us, uh, Shapeshift's been around in the space for a really long time. Um, our move into a DAO is pretty recent. Just, you know, back in July, we really started this in earnest. And, you know, so it's been going awesome and we're really excited about it. But Shapeshift itself goes back, you know, nearly seven years. So we feel like kind of old timers in the crypto space, but we love everything going on, especially with new projects like Olympus. Awesome. Yeah, we're, we're very glad to have you guys as well. Um, I, I wanted to introduce Tex as well, and then Glue is up here. Uh, both members of the DAO, Tex Handles Partnership. Uh, I don't know what Glue doesn't do, and Tex. Uh, they're both multifaceted uh, big brains. So glad to have you guys up here um, as well. Uh, I wanted to start this, uh, this QA off by saying, you know, this is kind of the precursor to tomorrow's AMA for the uh, Shapeshift. Uh, times Olympus Pro launch. So we're very excited for that. Um, everybody that's in here right now, um, we're going to we're going to have that AMA tomorrow. Let me pull up the, the times really quick. And it looks like it's going to be at um, 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and that would be 4 p.m. UTC in the Shapeshift server. Um, we should have that server link. So if we could get somebody to, to go ahead and uh, post that in the chat, for those of you that do not have that link, make sure you join us tomorrow. We're going to be doing an AMA, answering a lot of questions that revolve around what Olympus Pro is, uh, how it benefits uh, Shapeshift, and how it can benefit uh, a, really any protocol in that case. Um, so to start this off, and with trying not to be as long-winded as I can be sometimes, uh, we'd like to welcome you guys uh, from Shapeshift. And is there any way you guys could give us kind of an intro into uh, Shapeshift, and uh, both as a trading platform and as a DAO? Yeah, I can I can start. Um, first, are the lo-fi beats still on, or is that just me? They should be turned off. If they're not turned off, uh, we might have to take the DJ out. Maybe I'm in like too many DAO rooms at this point. There we go. Okay, we're good. <laughs> there he goes. <laughs> cool. Um, all right. Yeah. So a quick overview of Shapeshift. Um, Shapeshift has been around since early 2014, and uh, was essentially set up to be an exchange that was non-custodial. So we would allow people to trade one digital asset for another. The first one ever was Bitcoin for Litecoin. 
this was you know pre pre Ethereum existing, um, and it was created in the wake of the Mt. Gox catastrophe. Um, perhaps some of your listeners were around in crypto back then, uh, but it was essentially you know trying to solve this problem of how do you let people trade without an exchange centralizing the risk and the pools of capital that the users held. So um, that was Shapeshift's model. You basically arrived on the website. You would choose the coin you wanted to send in and a coin you wanted to get out. And we, as the counterparty, were essentially the market maker, and we would do that trade for you. And there was no um, no user account. There was no KYC. It was just like a crypto vending machine. And then uh, that model you know, served us well, and we, we were growing with the crypto world for a few years. We got into 2017 and that whole crazy bubble. Um, we grew up to, you know, over 100 people. And um, as we got into 2018, we had done a lot of legal review into our model and whether we could continue with this, you know, no KYC um, feature, which everyone, which everyone loved. Ultimately, we came to the very tragic and awful conclusion that we were going to have to implement KYC. And fundamentally, this came down to the fact that we were an intermediary in the trade. So um, we implemented KYC. We lost like 99% of our business, and the next couple of years were really rough. And we basically had to dig out of that hole and figure out a way to get back to our uh, our original model of protecting users by not taking their assets and protecting users by not taking their personal information that we didn't want and they didn't want to give us. And really, the story of our last year and a half has been one of embracing the whole DeFi world and realizing that the technology has really gotten more advanced. And we've now been utilizing decentralized exchange technology to remove Shapeshift entirely from the trading process. So we are no longer an intermediary. And as of April of this year, we once again removed KYC from Shapeshift. Um, so that was a huge milestone. And then in July, we announced that we were actually going to go one step further and decentralize the whole goddamn thing. So Shapeshift is in the process of becoming a DAO. Uh, there is a Shapeshift DAO that exists today, and the Shapeshift Corporation is in the process of unwinding. So um, that was that was a lot. I'll I'll leave it there as an introduction. That was yeah. Wonderful. Tex, yeah. go ahead, man. We're gonna that, me and Tex are gonna bounce off one another, you guys, because uh, I think that it's just it's great to get a couple Omis involved in this. Uh, Tex, floor is yours, my friend. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I've been following you guys for a while, and um, I think one of the interesting things about Shapeshift and what it was trying to do back in 2014 was kind of facilitate this decentralized swapping of assets, maybe before the technology caught up to it. Um, how do you guys see um, the role that Shapeshift is playing now as it's moving to facilitate transactions decentrally uh, through technology such as ThorChain, for example? Yeah, so we Shapeshift is no longer an exchange in any way. Uh, however, users can exchange through Shapeshift. And what that means is we've integrated various DEXs into the Shapeshift interface. So people can still trade through Shapeshift, but, but we are no longer providing an exchange. We're just integrating all the best DEXs that are out there. And um, you can think of Shapeshift at this point as an open source interface for crypto. And you can interact with uh, different chains. You can interact with all the different digital assets and you can do the basic services that you would want. Everything from you know the basic wallet functionality of sending and receiving to trading, um, staking and lending will come out soon. And I think fundamental to Shapeshift is, is always that it is non-custodial. You always control your keys and it is multi-chain. So, you know, many of these DeFi apps are always just one chain, like they're an Ethereum app or it's a Solana app. And you can't really cross between those worlds very easily. Shapeshift is the interface that allows you to interact with multiple chains and multiple ecosystems from one place. Uh, and now in an open source uh, way, which is controlled, owned, and governed by its community. Yeah, one thing I'll, I'll just kind of add on to that is, you know, the way Shapeshift has evolved, you know, historically, we really were an exchange and we were the counterparty to every trade, which is, you know, what really got us caught up in a bunch of regulatory nonsense um, for a number of years. But it, what we're really embracing in this new world is this ability 
for users to try, swap peer to peer through these decentralized protocols and Shapeshift becoming a community owned decentralized interface that anyone can use to connect to any of these uh, exchanges or really do anything they want to do in the blockchain world um, over time. I mean, I see it as not just a place where you will do exchanges and manage your portfolio, but over time it can really become kind of, you know, a portal to any sort of blockchain based DeFi type thing you want to do. Um, you know, even something like, you know, what's happening with the Olympus bonds or bonding programs and stuff like that, it would be really great to eventually, you know, have integrations so that you could do that directly to the Shapeshift interface and access Olympus and things like that. So um, that's kind of the way we're moving is really just embracing every form of these decentralized protocols and empowering all these communities to to really own this these interfaces that we think is a, a super important aspect of this ecosystem. Absolutely. And um, to add on to that, when you mentioned that the community owns part of the interfaces, where does the Fox token uh, factor into all of this that we'll be enabling bonds for? Yeah, great question. So another interesting and unique thing about Shapeshift right now is that we're not putting fees on top of these decentralized protocols. Ultimately, this is all up to the, the community, but I'm a community member and I'm pretty against putting fees on top of these protocols. Like, I like MetaMask, but I think it's really lame that they charge 0.875% on every swap that you do in their interface when you can also just go straight to these decentralized protocols and, and not pay those extra fees. I feel pretty strongly that we're, we're here in DeFi to get rid of these middleman, not, not to become one ourselves. And I'm not against protocol fees. I think protocol fees make sense and they serve a purpose. I'm just against these interfaces putting fees on top of protocols. And I think that uh, it's actually going to be the best for both users and for the Shapeshift DAO if we, if we don't put fees. I think no fees doesn't mean no revenues. In fact, quite the opposite. I think no fees can actually result in the greatest revenues for the DAO. So an example for this is these, these affiliate revenue programs that more and more protocols and crypto services are starting to offer. Uh, one example is Yearn. So right now, you know, if you guys didn't know, Yearn has an affiliate revenue partnership where any interface, an interface just like Shapeshift that drives volume to the Yearn protocol, um, can earn up to 50% of the, of the profit that Yearn generates from their protocol fees. So models like this, this is just one example, but there's a proposal up right now for a fiat on and off ramp who wants to do an affiliate revenue share with us. A YAP proposal just passed recently for affiliate revenue program, a per protocol proposal on their end passed recently for an affiliate revenue program. So the idea is that um, with this network we're building, it's a community owned open source interface where users can do all the different crypto stuff they wanna do across multiple different blockchains without putting fees on top. That's pretty cool. The, where Fox comes in is that what we can do is whenever the DAO is generating revenue off of any of these uh, user transactions, then the DAO can also uh, reward the user with Fox. And uh, this will all be up to the community and it's all in progress. These are the types of things that we're brainstorming right now, how to, how to best implement uh, these programs. But you can imagine the idea is that users can use these uh, protocols not only for free, but actually uh, earn Fox tokens. So it's, it can actually be better to use Yearn through Shapeshift than going directly to Yearn, because if you use it through Shapeshift, not only are you not paying extra fees, but you're also generating, uh, you're earning Fox tokens. And the DAO is generating revenue that these Fox tokens control. So it's a really, uh, I think, beautiful model that can create some pretty strong network effects Whereas Shapeshift becomes the best way to use more and more of these protocols, a lot of the top power DAP users and DGENs come interact with these protocols through Shapeshift. And then if you're a protocol and you want to have, you want users, which every protocol does, right? And you want the, the active power users, then it's going to make sense for you to not only integrate with Shapeshift, but also do an affiliate revenue deal with Shapeshift so that your protocol has extra Fox incentives on top of it. Does that make sense, Dex? Yeah, it does. And I think you guys have built a really elegant system to kind of capture some of those network effects. And also, in addition to having this group of, you know, DeFi traders, DGENs, I know at Olympus, we kind of prioritize security above all else. Um, we did a big promo in FOMO3 about uh, advertising hardware wallets. Can you guys speak a little bit to um, your acquisition of KeepKey and kind of enforcing like uh, security best practices for crypto? Want to take that one, John? Yeah, sure. So yeah, um, yeah, back in 2017, I guess it was, uh, Shapeshift acquired KeepKey, which at the time kind of still is, was one of the three 
three biggest hardware wallets, uh, just behind Ledger and Trezor. Um, and we think it's a, a really great device. And when we launched our new, our ShapeShift web platform um, a few years ago, um, it was really centered around hardware wallets. That was actually when we first started it. Um, we only allowed hardware wallets. And part of that was born out of a design of us really wanting to enforce uh, good security and self, self-custody among crypto users, which is not always the easiest thing, especially for newer users. Um, now, of course, hardware walls are not necessarily the easiest thing for newer users either. So we've been trying to improve that UX over time. Um, but KeepKey Key was bought by Shapeshift because of how much we believe in the importance of hardware wallets being kind of that bridge between giving users the access to that self-custody, but making it easier for them to manage without exposing their keys directly online as every software wallet does, or it makes it you know much easier to be attacked. Um, so that's always been an important aspect, and we do support um, you know, basically the three major hardware wallets of Key, Key, Trezor, and Ledger all in our interface today and will be in our new V2 open source uh, app, web app that we are launching soon that the, uh, the DAO is working on. So that is a really important aspect to us, and security and self-custody is really kind of at the root of what Shapeshift is. You know, back to when we were in exchange to where we're going now, ultimately, to us, it's all about self-custody in crypto. If If we're not empowering people to hold their own funds, then you just end up with things like Coinbase, which is kind of just banking 2.0. And that's not to, you know, go after Coinbase. I think they've done a very important service to the entire crypto community. That's very important. But it's really important to us that where crypto goes is kind of more what we're seeing, you know, in the explosion of the DeFi world over the last year, which is where the coolest, most innovative, interesting things are all things where you need to own your own keys. And if you need to own your own keys, it's best to do that in a secure manner. And the easiest way to do that is with the hardware wallet. Um, and that was really what motivated our acquisition and our further development of Key, Key over that time. Awesome. Yeah, that's some wonderful information. Thank you guys for, for sharing that with us. Uh, this, is a, this is a juicy AMA. I'm really, or q and I'm really enjoying it, you guys. I hope you guys are all enjoying it as well out there in chat. Uh, in the chat world. Um, so with that being said as well, I just wanted to ask Willie uh, a quick question. Um, you know, what are some of the key uh, learnings or challenges uh, that you see with scaling the organization and transitioning to a DAO? Um, are there any unforeseen hurdles that you've encountered? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So, you know, typically when a DAO starts out and I've, I've been a part of starting DAOs out from the beginning and, you know, you start with a small community, everyone knows each other for the most part. And, um, you know, you don't necessarily need like an organizational structure. You can have more of a flat, flat organization, and that works great. But then, as DAOs start to scale, we're experiencing this at Giveth right now. Um, another DAO, DAO that I've been a part of, where we got to the point where we had so many active contributors that it didn't quite work just to have this flat organization anymore. And we started kind of breaking up into different working groups or circles or whatever you want to call them. So I was really fortunate to have that experience as we were setting up the Shapeshift DAO. And uh, Shapeshift, you know, we have 65 full-time employees or I guess some of them have already been transitioned out. All of them will be transitioned out uh, by the end of this year. And, uh, you know, these are great uh, people that Shapeshift has recruited. They've got, you know, they're, they're savvy. They've got the skills that we wanted to recruit them for in the first place. And they got, you know, the knowledge of Shapeshift and the vision. So obviously, you know, I, I think it's in the DAO's interest. I'm, as a community member, I think that it's in the DAO's interest to retain as much of that talent as we can. So a big challenge is like, how can we set up the DAO um, to uh, not only make it a great uh, onboarding experience, great path for anyone, both Shapeshift employees and community members who want to get involved to start contributing, but how can we actually like do, how can we actually doubt that, right? Um, and so for a lot of DAOs too, you can imagine you have 65 full-time contributors, um, you know, making a proposal every time a single contributor has to get paid would be very uh, exhausting and overwhelming for token holders. So um, I'll post a cool little diagram here in the Shapeshift QA chat. But this is uh, kind of our current organizational structure for the DAO. And as you can see, token holders are on top. Token holders still control everything. But token holders don't have to uh, vote on every single expense or, uh, that, or you know, contributor for a work stream. So we have this level beneath the DAO for work streams. And uh, right now, we're using Colony for this really awesome uh, tool that's in closed beta right now on XDAI, but is about to open up uh, for open beta for their new V2. And what this enables us to do is basically these work streams can make proposals to the DAO for a budget. And then if token holders approve it, the funds get sent over to these work streams. 
And these work streams are basically like sub DAOs where um, they are completely autonomous. They can allocate the funds that they receive from the DAO however they best see fit to achieve the goals and the, the mission that they propose and their proposal to the DAO. Um, and they don't need the token holders don't need to worry about it. So work streams can allocate their funding on Colony once they've received it. Um, and uh, then uh, as long as the work stream is doing a good job, then token holders can just basically see you know, their KPIs, whether they've achieved their goals from the last proposal, and then can use that to inform whether they should continue funding the work stream or like in an extreme case, maybe the work stream is really doing a bad job and the DAO needs to step in and, uh, you know, replace a work stream leader or, uh, you know, sh take away the work stream's funds if they're really doing a bad job. All that's possible. And it's possible in a way that's still very decentralized and Fox token holders still have complete control uh, at the end of the day. But uh, as long as the work stream is doing a good job, which so far they've done a great job and the hope is that most of these work streams the majority of the time will be doing a good job because it's in their best interest to do so. Uh, the token holders can just uh, approve those those budget proposals, basically. So that's one way that we've been able to still, you know, take all of the organizational structure and uh, learnings that we've had at Shapeshift, being a company for seven years, and translate that into a decentralized organization where we can still get shit done efficiently, um, but also, you know, doing it in a way where there is no central point of failure, and ultimately, Fox token holders still have complete control. Is like one of the coolest. Uh origin stories for a DAO that I've heard. I don't, I don't know that I've actually heard about a company that had been in existence for such a long time transition smoothly into, into the DAO format. Uh, a question for the audience and for maybe some of the builders out there, what would be one piece of advice you'd give to people looking to start a DAO, whether it's from having an existing corporate structure today um, or just bootstrapping a DAO from the ground up? What's, like, what's one piece of advice you'd give them? Is that to us? Yeah, yeah, to, yeah. To the to the shapeshift team, anyone. <laughs> yeah. Um, so first, you know, we aren't exactly experts on this yet. I mean, maybe maybe Willie is, but we're we are ourselves learning. And if we had waited for every question to be answered, or every box to be checked, or every risk to be gone, uh, we never would have done it. So if you're going to become a DAO, you need to be ready to step out onto the frontier and to have a lot of uncertainty. And anyone in crypto should be ready to do that anyway, but more so for a DAO. Um, I think one piece of advice here is I th I've seen a lot of discussion about how DAOs can like register as LLCs in Wyoming and how DAOs can like form, um, you know, like employment contracts and uh, basically start to do all the, and like have bank accounts. I think that's a total wrong path. Um, if a DAO is registering somewhere, it, it's no longer a DAO. And so if you are trying to uh, form a DAO and you start taking it in the direction of an LLC, you have to ask yourself, like, what are you actually trying to do? The whole purpose of a DAO is is the D, that it is decentralized. And so um, people should recognize that there are pros and cons to that. And being a DAO isn't for everyone. But if you're going to be a DAO, don't try to make it uh, a centralized entity in any way, shape or form. That would be my my advice so far. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. And in general, finding you know finding missions and people you want to work with, and and being willing to collaborate. I mean, one thing I've really loved uh, about just interacting with the Olympus community over the last few weeks, as we've been setting up this bond program and everything that's about to go live tomorrow, and that I really believe in in the DAO world, is I really believe DAOs compared to like old business types in the way that corporations work. They really allow for a lot more collaboration across communities, you know, both in the community and across communities, and for what I would call kind of positive sum wins, meaning that, you know, it's really possible for something like, you know, as the shapeshift down the Olympus DAO to partner as we're doing, and for that to benefit both both uh, communities and other communities, and that really embracing that collaborative mindset among the DAOs and not trying to just um, view this in the old corporate mindset of trying to outcompete everything else. I think is a really important part of where DeFi is going and what DAOs allow um, and building with that mindset and not trying to, you know, be assume all these resources are overly scarce. The best way for DAOs and this new these new types of economies to win are to find ways to interoperate with each other 
and to build that pie much bigger for everybody rather than trying to become the biggest player of a very small pie, which today among DAOs, they still are, you know, like a lot of these things have grown, but compared to, you know, overall world economy and stuff, this is still a very, very small, nascent experimental thing. Um, the most important thing is for us to collaborate and realize that what you're really competing against are the old systems and not each other, in my opinion, at least not as much. Yeah, I want to riff on that for a sec. So um, it has been super cool to see how DAOs collaborate. And if we were talking about, you know, traditional centralized Shapeshift as a company, you know, you go back a couple of years, Shapeshift is a company, and let's say there's some other cool project out there, also a centralized company, and we want to integrate Shapeshift with that company. The traditional way you would do that is that there'd be some, you know, head of business development who would have a relationship and some discussions would occur sort of one-to-one, -one, uh, interacting on both sides. Um, and then at some point, if it looked interesting, you'd get all sorts of like legal review on both sides and legal review is pretty much where cool ideas go to die uh so that kills a lot <laughs> of really awesome collaboration and then ultimately it ends up with you know the signing of some contracts and only only a handful of people in each company kind of understanding what's going on so that's kind of the old traditional model and you compare that to to these DAOs, which are open and you see here you know, there's six of us up on stage and there's a couple hundred people in the audience and you have a meshing of our two communities, right? There are a bunch of people from the Shapeshift community here and a bunch of people from your uh, community here, the Olympus community. And everyone is just kind of interacting without any permission from anyone. You know, no one approved anyone to be at this meeting. The people who are most interested in it can be here and because everyone owns tokens of of one or both communities everyone has this shared economic interest in it and so you just get this really awesome um, bandwidth i guess between two projects where you have dozens or hundreds of people involved instead of one or two point people that you know can never really um, convey all the information across across teams so that's been really fun to see and, and something that i wouldn't have understood uh, understood before jumping into this yeah 100 percent agree I, I wanted to i like talking about DAOs and the future of work um yes it's it's one of the more interesting experiences to to go from a, a corporate um a corporate function where there's a lot of hierarchy uh, I, I know well they talked a little bit about the, the structure of of shapeshift that there is still working groups but one of the things that I've really enjoyed about DAOs is you check you check your ego and your and your meritocratic baggage at the door, um, and it's more of a collaborative environment to say we're all equals and we're all uh, collaborating together. And then to John John John's point earlier, I, I'm really curious how we solve the portability of our our skills and talent across DAOs because because I tend to agree um, this isn't a zero sum game if if one person is is doing well in one DAO, I think they can do well in another. I'm curious to um, hear Shapeshift's thoughts about how do you how do you actually transport talent across these DAOs? Or 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 what do you see as like um a way beyond just like this call, um, a way that DAOs can work together that are positive some? Yeah, it's a great question. And Willie, I know you probably have some thoughts on this, so I'll I'll give you the mic here in a second, but um this is something I've thought. So one thing that I think, and I'll, I'll kind of go to the old world for a sec, and then I'll back it up to what I think about this in this new DAO world. In the old world, you have all these companies, and the companies are very kind of, um, you know, monopolistic around people's time. They want their employees to work, you know, primarily or only on their stuff. They have employment contracts. They don't want, quote, unquote, conflicts of interest. They don't want you moonlighting, et cetera. Um, and I think that actually often works against companies' interests, especially this, this quote unquote, I've, I've heard this a lot in various companies I've been in, like conflicts of interest problem, when often it actually just stops um, collaboration between someone who might have ties to multiple projects <laughs> from getting those projects to collaborate and help each other. And I think in the DAO world, it's just so open that like, I fully expect, and if we already see this in Shapeshift, and even with someone like Willie, who's involved in multiple DAOs, and you know, I, I'm starting to get there myself as I um, experiment a little bit, that I think it makes a lot of sense for people to actually work across DAOs and that 
the, honestly, the best way for them to bridge DAOs together is to have a presence and to be a contributor to multiple of them. And that allowing them to do that actually lets them see the opportunities and the synergies where they can be like, okay, well, I'm doing this thing over here and I'm helping this DAO over here and they could actually really collaborate and I can help them do that. Um, I think ultimately that leads to better outcomes for all of these DAOs involved when you actually have that cross-pollination and that cross-collaboration of people working across them and helping them and not just focusing on one. And that's that's something that I think can really happen in the DAO world where you don't have to, the DAO does not have to be as monopolistic over your time of like, you should only work for our DAO and no one else. You should actually be encouraging um, your DAO members to go out and reach out to other communities, be part of other communities and find ways to collaborate and create, create those cross synergies. I think that's going to be a, a huge competitive advantage over the old kind of uh, normal corporate way of working that DAOs can do this. But yeah, Willie, I'm sure you have some thoughts on this too. Well said, yeah, I'll just, I'll just build on that. And I think, uh, you know, in the traditional corporate environment, there's a lot of inefficiency with, with full-time roles, right? Um, you, you get one job and you get a job description and, you know, you work for one company. That's, that's how most people currently work. But DAOs are just much more fluid and flexible. And really, it's all about adding value. You can, you know, with, all right, anyone who wants to add shape, value to the Shapeshift DAO, come on, add value. And I always say, like, if someone's adding significant value to a DAO and not getting rewarded, then the DAO is doing something wrong. And so what this creates is the opportunity for, like, really people to just shape whatever their dream job is. Whatever you like to do to add value, whether that's, you know, a number of different things, like techs wearing multiple different hats, or if all you like to do is make PO apps, that's all you want to do, then there's opportunities for you to do that in a DAO and get rewarded. And if you want to focus on something specific, you can go do that same thing for multiple different DAOs. So I just think it's, it gives a lot more flexibility and opportunity for more efficiency and specialization. And really the opportunity for anyone to kind of craft their dream job, which is much harder to do in the traditional corporate world. And things like that make me bullish on, on DAOs really being the, the future of work. And again, the way I think about it too is like DAOs, right now DAOs can pretty much do a lot of what centralized organizations can do. Like anything that you can do with a centralized organization until you get into the regulatory stuff where bank accounts and stuff like that, which I'm hopeful will be solved in the coming years. DAOs can still do a lot of the same stuff that or, traditional organizations can do. But now they can do so much more as well. And I think as the, the things that DAOs can't do that centralized corporations can do uh, get knocked down and people create solutions for each of these, uh, it's hard for me to imagine this, this new evolution to the way that organizations are structured uh, not continuing to be a trend that basically disrupts the, the traditional uh, organizational structures of the past. I agree 100%. This is a, a super enlightening conversation. I think we are growing our DAO quickly as well. And um, I, I resonate with a lot of the points that were made here from the Shapeshift team. So um, I, I agree 100% on that we, we should, should embrace collaboration across all the various ones that exist because together we strengthen the entire ecosystem. Um, that was great. Super. Sorry, I went off tangent. Totally there. agree. Hand it, hand it back to <laughs> no, I, I totally agree. Um, seeing it firsthand too, uh, working in the Olympus DAO, uh, it's, it's really empowering um, to individuals to be able to join uh, an organization, quote unquote, or you know, a group of like-minded individuals who are uh, all focused on one uh, goal. And to be able to jump in there and not have to drop a piece of paper, a stack of paper, this resume to say, hey, this is who I am, uh, judge me at uh, face value or, or by the cover of the book. Um, I, I love the fact that that does not exist in this space. Um, I, you know, it gives little Timmy in his mom's basement a chance to make millions of dollars and really solid lifelong connections. Um, it also gives Mr. Silicon Valley a chance to come in and not be judged from what he's done in his life, uh, you know, as far as the, the accolades or whatever that he's, he's, uh, he's built up. So I, I really find it, uh, the anonymity and just the, the ability to come in and really just be who you are and accepted for the work that you put in uh, is mind boggling. And it's amazing because we've seen such uh, success and just utter forward moving momentum in, in our, our DAO itself in Olympus. Um, and yeah, I totally agree with you on encouraging people like reach out, like spread your wings, go see how other people are doing it, you know, take what you can from those DAOs and then bring it back to your DAO and, and, and hopefully improve it like that way as well. Um, 
so just in general, totally agree with what you guys are saying. I think there, there's some really wonderful points that have been made there. Um, super yeah, but, excited. Go ahead. Eric. It, yeah. Um, there, there's a, a really good structural reason why what you highlight is the case. Uh, and that's because in a normal employment environment, there's so much friction in hiring someone and in firing them that you have to do a ton of vetting and you have to be super careful about who you bring into the organization and who you let out. And each of those activities is itself a whole big process that requires an HR department and, you know, like all sorts of steps. In in Dowland, anyone can just work with anyone with, with no friction, right? It doesn't matter who you are or where you are. The terms established are completely consensual and voluntary between the two parties. Um, we, you know, Shapeshift Dow does not need to worry about like Colorado employment laws, and it doesn't need to worry about laws in Paris, right? There, there's a reason that Shapeshift doesn't have any employees in France. It's because their HR laws are are absurd, and it, even if there was a talented person over there, it would be so costly to hire that person um, that we just wouldn't do it. And so, in the in the Dow world, you really get rid of all of that cruft. And you just get back to like individuals as individuals working together where they want, when they want, and how they want on mutual terms. And I think that's a that's a really beautiful outcome of of these DAOs that people really don't appreciate yet. I, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Honestly, um, it removes a lot of the ego and like that that you know the judgment that can come in corporate in the corporate world. I've worked many a corporate jobs in my in my life and. I'm actually very excited to wake up in the morning, grab my cup of coffee, and then sit in the chair and speak with all of these genius individuals that surround me every day in this virtual environment. Um, I truly believe uh, that in the near future, not even the far future, you know, the, the, the distant future, um, that DAOs are going to be everything. Like, I think we really will change. We see that with the political climate now and this, the virus and all this other stuff going on. It's really um, reiterating the fact that we need change from this certain, uh, this structure that's in place now. It's not to say that there's not things that we can take um, from the corporate world that are effective, but I think that it does speak to the fact that there's a lot that can be changed uh, that, would, that would benefit all of us. So yeah, great, great response, uh, Eric. Thank you for that, man. And on, on that note, Fatty, I just want to build on that. that yeah, please, uh, Willie. You, you can take stuff from the traditional world. And so I really think DAOs give us the best of both worlds because it's not to say that a DAO can't have a full-time contributor. And uh, I think in a lot of cases, if you want to work full-time for a specific DAO and uh, you're adding value, that it can definitely makes sense for, for a work stream or for a DAO to still hire some full-time contributors. But we're no longer limited to that. We can do full-time contributors. We can do bounties. We can do retroactive rewards for contributions. All these cool things that are available to DAOs um, just at their fingertips uh, gives you the ability to really structure it in the best of both worlds. And at Shapeshift, there was a question just in the Shapeshift in the QA chat, like, so how does someone apply for these jobs? Really, that's, that's definitely something that we're working on improving right now is how can we take all these opportunities across different work streams and make them more easily accessible? We're working on a, uh, a bounty and job board that will be on shapeshift.com that all the work stream leaders will have access to to post these available positions. But really, we leave that up to the, the work stream leaders. So, Work stream leaders basically make they make these proposals to the DAO saying, hey, here's here's our goals for the work stream, here's our mission, here's the success metrics that the token holders can track us on, and here's how much funding we're we're asking for. And so far you can see all these proposals that have been funded. There was one for the engineering work stream that got funded. That does include several full-time engineers. But oftentimes these these budgets are being uh, proposed in a way where there's uh, some salary for full-time contributors, as well as a uh, budget for bounties and for other just like miscellaneous rewards. And once that proposal gets approved, it's really up to the work stream leader to allocate that funding however they best see fit, basically, whether that's you know hiring full-time contributors or creating bounties or contracting with an agency. Really, we want to give them autonomy to uh, you know execute in whatever way they think is best to achieve the mission that they propose to the DAO. Yeah, that's a great answer, Willie. Um, speaking of the best of both worlds, I'm kind of wondering, um, to build on the question earlier about you know Shapeshift starting as a company and then transitioning into a DAO, how do you guys handle being public facing individuals based on your previous work with Shapeshift as a company and now maybe dealing with several con uh, contributors over at the DAO who are anonymous? 
Yeah, well, um, I personally love this aspect. Sorry, Eric. I'll let yeah, you go, go uh, right after this. Um, so I, you know, I've actually, I've, I'm, I've, so Eric's obviously been among the most public faces of Shapeshift throughout the course of our history. Um, but, but one of the things to look back on in Shapeshift's history that's pretty interesting is um, he didn't, when we started it, Eric was ag not actually public with his involvement in Shapeshift, at least for the first like six to seven months or so. He actually started it under a pseudonym to the point where I was actually having to be on calls uh, because people would recognize his voice. So I would have to pretend to be this other guy that wasn't him <laughs> um, as he was not, he was trying, he wanted, he really wanted Shapeshift to basically live and die on its own. And, and prove its value to the world on its own and not just because, you know, he was Eric Voorhees. And I always really appreciated that about that approach to the point where, like, I haven't actually, I don't use my full name in public and haven't for the full seven years, even speaking at conferences and such. Um, I've always gone, you know, by, by a pseudonym. And as a result, um, I'm very comfortable with this. And I honestly think that, you know, the future of these DAOs and the future of work is one where you don't, it doesn't need to be attached to a real world identity. Um, I know this is something uh, Balaji's talks about a lot, this idea of the pseudonymous economy. And I'm really starting to see that rise over the last year uh, with these DAOs. So personally, I love it because what you really want to reward someone with or what you, why you want to work with someone is because they just show up and show you their work product. They build their own reputation. They build the integrity. And it doesn't have to be tied to a real world identity at all. And in many ways, I think that actually creates better relationships for these types of environments. But yeah, go ahead, Eric. Sorry for interrupting you at the beginning. Yeah, um, I think if you're if you're in the crypto industry and you have a problem with pseudonymity, you're in the wrong industry, right? So any project needs to be comfortable with a hybrid of of pseudonyms and real identities in whatever capacity the participants want. Um, so yeah, our DNA has always been that pseudonyms are not just tolerated, but are actually encouraged. Like at, at Shapeshift. Um, even in our centralized form, we did not permit employees to be public with their real name just for OPSEC reasons, unless they went through a specific training to sort of come out with their real name. So they could opt in to do that if they want. But we've generally tried to have a default of privacy and a default of uh, pseudonymity unless someone really wants to opt into something else. Yeah, it's, it's truly incredible. Um, the times are changing. And it's kind of like join in or get ran over is how I feel. Uh, maybe maybe that thinking is incorrect, but I really don't feel I don't, don't feel that way. I feel like really it's we're going to make this the shift into um, these DAOs, and I think that everyone's going to see that they're so effective. I love what you said about it's kind of like show up and show us what you can do. Um, so I run marketing over at Olympus uh, with a lot of really ingenious, uh, just amazing individuals. And it, they all showed up. That was the beauty of it. It's like, you know, we need to get some stuff done today. Uh, and then boom, there's this new person that shows up. We don't know who they are, but all I can tell you is that the second that they showed up, they started getting shit done. And to me, that speaks just volume about who they are. And if they continue to do that, they start to shape themselves into somebody who becomes more permanent and, and somebody who's there all the time and you can rely on. And then as, as that evolves, they've now turned into uh, this, this concrete pillar of that DAO, all from being just this anonymous, completely like who, just a nobody on the internet at that time. Um, so I, I really love it. It's super exciting. And, and, and thank you for that answer. Uh, you know, Eric, this kind of segues into another question I wanted to ask you here um, is if you could give us like just a little rundown about how you got involved in the crypto. Um, both you and Zeus started off pretty heavy in Bitcoin, from my understanding. Um, how have your views changed over the years, uh, becoming more involved in DeFi and permissionless trading? Yeah, cool question. Uh, so... I learned about Bitcoin in May of 2011, and um, I just fell in love with it because I had been interested in, you know, separating money from state, but I didn't know how to do it. Bitcoin comes along and I'm like, wow, this is actually a plausible way to do it. And um, even though it was so tiny and no one cared about it back then, um, it seemed like a worthwhile thing to bet on. And so I just dove into it completely ever since. Um, you know, back then, Bitcoin was like 99% of, of all the value. Uh, there were some altcoins, but they were mostly things that people were just playing around with for, you know, technology reasons. None of them were doing anything super interesting. Um, and at, when, when Ethereum launched, 
obviously there was a Cambrian explosion of new assets and new utility from from different assets. You know, like the the whole first phase of the crypto industry was just cryptocurrencies, where each thing was just competing to be a currency. It was like Bitcoin or Litecoin, and you know, Litecoin has faster block times, and is that important or is that irrelevant? And these things were just competing in the, uh, on one narrow use case. And after Ethereum came out, it really ballooned into so many different use cases and different ways to think about things. So um, I've just appreciated how the the principle of decentralization, which was so fundamental to Bitcoin, uh, has been applied more broadly into all these different projects. I think I think Bitcoin is more decentralized when you have Ethereum that also exists, and I think it's important that Ethereum is not the only smart contract platform uh, out there. Um, and at this point, like the the branching innovation has just gotten wild. I mean, I, I can't keep up with it all. I'm sure you guys all feel like a similar um, yeah. feeling of awe. Yeah, you know, yep. it's like every week I come across a few new projects. You know, and a lot of it's garbage, but but there's some really amazing stuff. And um, every every time I sit back and think about it, I just realize like how screwed the banks are. They're so screwed. They they can barely understand you know Bitcoin. Like they have a, a conception of Bitcoin from from like 2013, and they think that they understand what the crypto industry is. Um, they are not at all prepared for the tsunami of financial innovation that is coming for them. Uh, and it's going to be a beautiful thing to wash it wash over the to watch it wash over the entire banking system and leave them all uh, out of work. Um, you know, I, I can't think of an industry that is more deserving of being made redundant than the than the financial industry and the banking system. Um, so, yeah, I, maybe that was a little a little long winded, but it's just been such a so inspiring to watch this all unfold and to to be able to participate in something so meaningful. Yeah, I completely agree, especially to your point about, you know, other crypto projects being sharper when they have other projects pushing them. It's uh, that steel sharpened steel quote. Um, one of the things that I wonder, looking at the evolution of Bitcoin over the years and the medium of exchange versus store of value debates, I know there's a big question that we have in Olympus that we're trying to solve is for the medium of exchange. Are you uh, pretty familiar with what we're trying to build and kind of have any thoughts about that? Uh, yeah, I think from familiar enough to comment. I mean, to, to the degree that Olympus acquires all sorts of assets of these other projects into its um, into its contracts and then has a has a coin that is backed by those assets. Um, this won't happen soon, but with over the long term, that could become a relatively stable uh, form of value. Um, I think to be good money requires a lot of time. Right, like this is one of the reasons why Bitcoin is is a, a nearly un, undethronable king is because you can't have more time in the market than Bitcoin, just by definition. Um, and I, I mean, frankly, I just love that there is a competition in money now. You know, pe people that say what money should be, um, they can make their guesses, but what money should be is just an open market, and people should be able to compete and try different models. And different monies might work well for different people. And finally, finally, we have this vast experimentation of different forms of money. Um, so, so yeah, you know, I, I love the ambition uh, that you guys are bringing to this, and uh, I look forward to seeing how it unfolds. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm also kind of curious. Um, if you have any macro theses that might play out going into 2022 for any of our community members who are hungry for alpha. <laughs> you want me to tell you which coins are going to go up? <laughs> um, maybe just macro theses. <laughs> yeah. I, so I, I guess two, two macro theses. Uh, one is that crypto is going to displace fiat. Like th this has been my broad thesis since getting into Bitcoin. Um, fiat and banking and analog finance is going away over the coming 10 to 20 years. And uh, digital, decentralized, open, immutable finance is going to take its place. So I think all of you in this room probably, 
you know, kind of hope that that's happening or, or think it is if you're here. But that's the biggest, that's the biggest uh, macro thesis that in finance that could exist, right? Like that the whole financial system is not just being tailored. It's not just being modified. It's going to be completely transformed from, from analog into digital. Um, so that's huge. And then I, I think the second thing is to just caution everyone that in crypto, you, you have this incredible innovation and you inevitably get into these speculative cycles and these bubbles in valuations, which pop and prices decline and a lot of people get wrecked and it feels really horrible for months or years. And if this is your first time in crypto or, or if, you know, if you're new within the last two years, you just need to start mentally preparing for that. Um, I've been through three of these waves at this point, and they're brutal, even for people who have been through them. So always consider that you know you should not be investing more than you can lose. You should realize that all of this stuff, including Bitcoin, is highly speculative, highly volatile, and you just need to be very careful with it. And as long as you can take that approach, then you know have fun and to ape, and ape, ape into whatever you want. Yeah, I mean, we're and I'll I'll just add on where I think this is going, and uh, more or less is over the next year or two. Is I really think these DAOs, you know, things like Olympus, things like the Shapeshift DAO, and this synonymous economy that we were talking about earlier, is really going to become like maybe the most important economies in the world over the next few years. And that seems really weird to say from where we currently sit and how how alien and unused to that uh, the majority of the world is right now. But I really think this ability to, you know, just jump online, no matter where you live, get involved with multiple communities, contribute however you can, add value, uh, create synergies between other communities, that's going to become such a distinct competitive advantage over every way that we've worked before, or every way we've collaborated and coordinated before, that I just, I think that's going to become a kind of unstoppable snowball over the next few years, certainly over the next three or five, from my perspective. Yeah, yeah hard, hard to imagine banks competing with the DAOs. They're already <laughs> <Right>? struggling enough. <laughs> yeah, it's all going to change in, in my eyes as well. I, I definitely think that there's going to be a massive shift. This wave is going to to break and crash, and people are going to have to adapt. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have girlfriends that that are in disbelief of the magic internet uh, coin that we all co uh, collect. I know. I know my girl is constantly just in disbelief, uh, but I think in the next five years, I, like, and this is so speculative, but um, I think that's really going to change. I think that this this fiat currency and uh, the bullshit of the banks and having these middlemen that that really just uh, they do you dirty. Um, I think that's going to have to disappear. And I really have my fingers crossed for that. And I think that all of us here uh, in the Discord in general. Uh, and across the DeFi space are, are contributors to that change. So uh, I think we all need to pat ourselves on the back for being some of the visionaries and the people on the front lines making that change. Because without all of us, uh, none of the shit would be happening. So um, love you guys. Um, I, I want to live in a world where someone named Fatty Bags displaces someone named Jamie Diamond. I, I feel right. like that's a, that's a world, <laughs> that's a world of beautiful and poetic justice. Isn't it? It's, it's beautiful. And, and thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah. So anything else uh, that you guys would like to add? I want to be respectful of everyone's time. We wanted to keep this around an hour. Um, you know, I, I'm going to let J-Man tell you guys about tomorrow's AMA, uh, which is uh, the more official um, Olympus Pro. I'm sorry, Olympus. Uh, yeah. Pro plus the um, Shapeshift. Uh, collaboration there. Sorry, guys, the, did not sleep. I got a bunch of little cats that run around and keep me up. Um, so if you'd like to hop up here, J-Man, let everyone know uh, the time tomorrow that people need to show up in the Shapeshift Discord. Please do that now, my friend. Sounds good. Thanks, Fatty. Yeah, so uh, we will be launching tomorrow Olympus Pro Bonds uh, with the Shapeshift team. So we are going to be hosting an AMA over on the Shapeshift uh, Discord. Uh, we're actually going to be going live at 12 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. UTC. And for the sake of the Shapeshift community, uh, 10 a.m. Uh, mountain Time. <laughs> so we will be going live over there. We're going to have, uh, you know, Jeff X. We're going to have Glue. We're going to have a few of the Strategos from the DAO itself being around and kind of answering questions that anybody from the Shapeshift community will have. So make sure you head on over there tomorrow at uh, 12 p.m. Eastern. I know it's kind of in the middle of the day for some folks. 
but it will be worth it because there's lots of stuff to uh, digest there as as Shapeshift goes live, of course. Um, uh, with that being said, since we are, you know, we have this whole conversation of the DAO fresh in our minds, I would like to reach reach out to everyone in the audience as well as we are currently uh recruiting and the dow so feel free to join in and you know get involved uh we're, we're going to be posting some links now where actually if you are watching on twitch or youtube you will see a dow recruitment video we're going to just post up in a bit um as we continue talking but we are actively looking for you know engineers marketers content creators community managers uh there's a, a vast vast field for everybody to get involved um, and it goes back to what you guys were talking about earlier is the, the power of the DAO is not necessarily that it's anonymous. It's the fact that all these individuals who have real world experience can get involved and contribute in some way, depending on how much they want to get involved. So you can have someone that comes in and just absolutely, you know, quits their job, starts working for the DAO and it becomes their full time job. You know, and, and that's the good thing about DAOs is that you can get involved with whatever department you want and as many departments as you want. Love it. Thank you, uh, thank you for sharing that, J Man. Um, you know, I want to leave the floor open um, for the shapeshift gentlemen. Uh, is there anything that you would like to to leave our listeners with? Um, is there anything that you'd like to share? Uh, we are super grateful to have you guys here, and and more than glad. So please, the floor is yours. If you have any closing comments you'd like to add, yeah, I just want to give you guys some major praise. The whole Olympus team, Tex, Glue, Fatty Bags, J Man, the whole all the Omis. It's just been an absolute pleasure working with you guys to get this done. I think it's a perfect, perfect example for just how powerful these DAO to DAO partnerships can be. Um, it was super smooth, and it's pretty, pretty amazing to see how you know we had a handful of interactions, a handful of meetings and stuff, but really not, not that many. And you know, in a, in a matter of weeks, we were able to take this really awesome idea, get the whole community aligned and excited about it, and actually uh, make it a reality. So, props to you guys. Uh, really amazing to see everything you guys are doing over here with the Ohm community, which you guys have built and this is definitely one of the, the strongest DAO communities that we've seen out there. So you guys are doing a great job. Keep it up. I'm excited to be working with you guys. Really looking forward to, to these Fox Bonds launching tomorrow. Yes. Yes. We are super excited to have you guys, uh, you know, part of the family as well. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to see this kind of growth and just to have these kind of genius individuals uh, surrounding all of us. So um, let's make sure that we, we drop the uh, shapeshift. Um, Discord in the chat so that we can make sure to funnel over anybody that's in here that's listening and that is curious. Um, I think Willie would be the best contact for any kind of DAO uh, questions. Is that correct, Willie? Don't let me overstep here. Uh, yeah, and feel free to, to DM Eric. He might be a little slower to respond. He, um, my DMs are always open. John is always John's DMs are always open. Happy to chat with you guys about any of the DAO stuff. Also, if you guys have any questions about any of the stuff that we're doing as a DAO, like Colony or anything like that, we'd be happy to chat with anyone on the OM side and share what we've learned so far. Yes. This is awesome. This is, I just wanted to drop in at the end and say this is a great chat. Willie, it's impressive to see that, that I think uh, I saw Eric's tweet. It's the first D to D type engagement. And I think uh, it, I'm impressed we did zero legal review between our you know entities with red lines and the rigmarole that normally exists. And, and I think it's awesome. So. I appreciate this. This conversation was fun. I think Zeus dropped in chat and said the same thing. Heck yeah. Um, yeah, I think you will just put it well, but we'll just hop in and say, yeah, join, like others said, you know, join in our Discord. Um, find ways to cross collaborate. We'd love to, uh, to chat if anyone else has any other ideas about how our communities can collaborate even after the bonds go live tomorrow. But certainly we are super excited for these bonds launched. I love how you, you all have. Uh, and Olympus really uh, been pioneers in this whole concept of protocol-owned liquidity. And the Shapeshift DAO is really excited to join that club starting tomorrow. So thank you all for all you're doing and uh, hope to see you all around. Yes, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, everybody from Shapeshift for joining today. Thank you, everybody from the Olympus DAO and Olympus in general uh, for joining and making this possible. Uh, if you guys have any questions about tomorrow's AMA over in the Shapeshift, Dis Shapeshift Discord, please feel free to DM me directly and I will get you some more information if you didn't catch it. Um, with that, I want to say thank you to everybody and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. And uh, thanks for joining. Cheers, thanks, all. See you. Thanks, y'all.